And in which war did you serve? I, I served in the Army of Occupation in World War II. Okay. And what was your branch of service? My branch of service was the uh, uh, United States Army Engineers, Combat Engineers. And uh, my work was uh, primarily with a survey group in the Ryukyu's Islands. In, in what, where were they the Ryukyu's Islands. That's a string of islands that includes Japan down into uh, Okinawa, Aishima, Okinawa, Gunto, the islands through there. Could you do me a favor? To, can you stall that possibly? Your, the islands, Ryukyu's? Ryukyu's? <laughs> R-Y... Let's see, no, R-U-Y-K-U-Y-S. I've got it written down. Got it but... close. Okay. <laughs> um, what was your highest rank? My highest rank was uh, uh, T-5. Okay. Uh, I was listed for promotion to Buck Sergeant just before I left Okinawa, but when I left Okinawa, that didn't go with me, so I stayed with that... Uh, the only difference that would have made is in some of the benefits after I, when I was mustering out. Right. So, tell me about how you ended up going to Army. Were you drafted or did you enlist? Or? I was drafted. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, class of 1945, in the Housatonic Valley Regional High School in Falls Village, Connecticut, uh, I was, I, I explored all the services to see how quickly I could get into action in World War II, when the, world, the war was still on. And the Battle of Okinawa, which I'll refer to later, uh, began on uh, April 1st and lasted roughly three months, ended in, uh, in July. And uh, that, that battle uh, was the final battle before the Battle of Japan, which, as we know, never really happened, but I was figuring that was my chance to be in the service. You can be rather stupid, you know, at 17 and 18 years old. So <laughs> I checked out all the services, and the best deal I got from the uh, was from the Coast Guard, and they told me that uh, if I signed up with the Coast Guard, they could have me ready for the invasion of, of uh, Japan uh, in six weeks. That's rather frightening when I think back on it. And then uh, I waited up the, my date to... Uh, uh, to go with the Coast Guard was uh, August 16th, 1945. Then the first nuclear bomb was exploded in Hiroshima in, uh, on August 6th, and the second one in Nagasaki on August 9th. And I was notified on the 15th not to show up on the 16th uh, unless I was willing to stay four years. And I wasn't interested really in four years in the service. So at that point, I was drafted by the uh, 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 by Mr. Truman, and uh, who I admired a great deal, and I went to I uh, went into service in the uh, actually the end of January, but I, I'm down for the first of February, 1947. So that's how my that's how I got into the service. I've been very active, and uh, before that, I was an air raid. I was the youngest air raid warden in the country, and really? we li lived on a farm about four or five miles out of town. And they needed an air raid warden out there. It was mainly forest, but the uh, there's only one one other farm fairly near us. Two others actually, but the uh, the reason they the reason they they needed the warden was because of incendiary bombs. If they were dropped with the forest, that would be a real problem. But I was only 15, and they offered a job to my father. My father said, "No, I'm not doing that. He'll do it." And so they got special permission. I think they had to go to the federal government, and I still have the paper on it somewhere where my thumbprint on it that I was officially the air raid warden. And the uh, that was I followed the war very closely in all the battles and was anxious to do my part. So then when I finally wound up going in, I was inducted uh, in New Haven on the 1st of February, 1946, war having ended in August of uh, 45. That was the combat part, part of the war, but the war technically was still on until September 16th, 1946. And actually, all the final settlements didn't occur. I read someplace uh, last night until 1972. So they were still lingering 
things of that war. So I, I uh, was inducted uh, in, uh, in New Haven, and from there went to uh, Fort Devens in Massachusetts. And this is in this was the first week of February in uh, 1946. It was cold, and the the one thing I was so pleased to be to have issued there was a heavy overcoat. And uh, I didn't have a lot of a lot of money, or I didn't have a lot of clothes, and just the ones I wore on the farm. But uh, I did get a full overcoat there, and I was there for two or three weeks and grew, drew various duties, and uh, you had a chance there to sign up for uh, any branch that you wanted. That didn't mean you'd get it, but you could sign up, and I put down Army Engineers as my, uh, my first choice. And uh, I came home once during that time. Uh, I got a ride from Fort Devens to Air, Massachusetts on a bus, and hitchhiked home from there, and then, uh, I don't know how far it is, but it's a hundred some miles, and then hitchhiked back again uh, a few days later, stopping to see my grandfather, uh, who lived in Lenox, Massachusetts, and I was anxious to see him. He was fairly old at that time, or at least sounded old to me at that time. It doesn't, it doesn't even work, because I'm older than he was at that point. Uh, from there, I went, to, uh, I went to Fort Belvoir and the basic training, in uh, Platoon 3, Company A, I don't know what battalion, uh, for tra basic training. And it was the uh, same training as the infantry training that we, ha that we had at that point. And uh, it was, it was uh, tough training in a way, uh, very demanding, but I was in pretty good shape in those days. And uh, it didn't bother me very much. I did come down with a tremendous cold and... Uh, when I when I go out and for the morning workouts and things like that, uh, I lose my breakfast sometimes because of the cold. And uh, but the guys kept saying, uh, "Don't don't go to sick leave because if you do, you'll be out of this training group and then you won't get what you signed up for." So I st I stuck that out and came out of it very well. And by the end of that, uh, I would even sometimes on Sunday uh, run the obstacle course with a couple other guys just for practice and. They thought I was crazy at that point, which I probably was. So after that training, I put in for uh, either to go to uh, 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 topographic survey school or to uh, operate heavy equipment. We had a Caterpillar tractor back on the farm, and I loved that tractor, and I thought this was a small one, and uh, they had D7s and D8s down there. That really appealed to me. I figured, wow, <laughs> I can get a chance to drive those, but... I was selected for the uh, uh, for the uh, the uh, survey school, and uh, I was in class ninety nine of the engineer school, which is a very fine school operated at Fort Belvoir. And if you don't know the location of Fort Belvoir, that's uh, about seven miles out of Alexandria, Virginia, which is about six miles out of uh, Washington D.C. So we were about thirteen, fourteen miles from. Uh, uh, from Washington, so I saw quite a bit of Washington uh, during that time. Uh, the uh, the uh, school was uh, was uh, pretty challenging. Uh, there were th three different branches to it. One was the uh, the instrument people who operate uh, worked with the instrument. The others uh, were the uh, recorders who had to put all of this stuff together, and the other classes were the computers. You know, we think of computers today in a totally different way, but uh, in those days, computers were guys with slide rules and logarithms and things like that, and I steered, steered as clear of that as possible and uh, uh, got my cert certification uh, 228, I think it was, uh, as, a, as an instrument man. And uh, so I, co I completed school there uh, sometime, I think it was uh, probably late July or so. And uh, that, that was, as I said, an uh, excellent course. We, uh, we did some actual surveying uh, that, was, that was used by the USGS down there as well during the time. And we had the new theodolites, which are a glorified transit, which uh, nothing like what we have today. But uh, uh, Wild T3 was the top theodolite in the uh, in the world, I think at that time we were taught to use those, which we wound up using in uh, 
in Japan and Okinawa later on. What's the what's the Theoda light? What's that? Is that the Theoda light is a is a glorified transit, but with a regular transit, you you could take readings with it. You couldn't take with a regular transit. Uh, the transit would tell you the angle you were shooting and. Uh, Theodolite, if you use a stadia board, which was a wide board that Rodman stood with, stood with on the uh, opposite side of a river or something like that, so you wouldn't have to measure across the river, uh, you could take the readings with, on a stadia board with a Theodolite and it would tell you uh, within first order of uh, error, and I can't remember what it was, but it was a very, very, very small amount of error, uh, just exactly what the distance was. So that's so we, we were we were taught to use those. They they worked very well. We uh, uh, from there I had a delay in route. And a delay in route is uh, something that started back in the uh, I think the time of the revolution or something like that. And uh, they they paid you to you would I left Fort Belvoir and they paid me to show up 19 days later. So you're getting a furlough and travel time. And that's what a delay in route was. And a delay in route was from, uh, from Fort Belvoir to uh, Fort Lawton in the state of Washington, which I had never been uh, uh, west of New York State at that time because I was still in school and, uh, and we didn't, you know, people didn't travel in those days like they, like they travel today. Uh, my mother saw it at the time, but my father died during my senior years in high school, senior year in high school, so. I probably could have gotten a deferment, but I felt that I, I wanted to serve. So uh, my mother wanted to uh, uh, pay for an airline ticket, which would have been on DC threes and four stops. I could have gotten across the country, and I said I really wanted to take the train and see the country. And so I uh, started off in August. I went to uh, uh, New York City and took the train to Chicago, the old water level route, and then took the train from uh, Chicago through the Northern Rockies. And uh, th this was not a sleeper. I was in a day coach all the way. And I don't think I slept more than three or four hours the whole trip. I was, every time I could, I was up taking pictures. And I was just fascinated by how great the country was. And uh, I'd heard of a lot of these places. And so I, I arrived in, uh, in uh, uh, Fort Lawton, uh, which is which is now uh, later on became a, a college, uh, Seattle Pacific University, where I taught at a little bit later, but it had nothing to do with the army. But I, I got to Fort Lawton and I went through uh, uh, senior training there, which was another couple weeks of training where. Instead of firing at 100 yards, you're fired at 500 yards and uh, things of that type. And uh, that, was, that was very good training. I did, uh, I did well on that. And uh, then we were scheduled to go overseas. And uh, used to be a joke among the guys. Well, everybody wanted to go to ETO. That was the uh, Eastern Theater of Operations because the war had ended earlier there. And that was a real nice place to be and everything else. Uh, I learned that for a, when I was told I was going to ETO, I was going to the eastern tip of Okinawa, <laughs> and, uh, oh. which was not an army term at all, but uh, that's where we were headed. So uh, I worked at, uh, uh, at Fort Lawton for a considerable period of time, and uh, then uh, we did things like help unload cargo ships and things of that type that uh, really weren't army jobs. It was the the army base where you had all these guys waiting to be assigned somewhere. And so then I was assigned to the uh, uh, Webster Victory, SS Webster Victory, which was a uh, um, it was a freighter, but these were converted for uh, as troop transports. Uh, they weren't like the regular troop transports that seated maybe. Uh, uh, they're, they're carried about 5,000 people. This, this maximum, they could get 1,400 people in it. So we got on the, uh, we get on this. And I was with, uh, some of the fellows I'd been to school with and a couple that I'd been in even in basic training with. So you, you sort of got some guys that you get, you'd see, you'd see quite a bit. And I remember boarding the ship and getting up on deck and it was a nice evening. And then, uh, 
uh, the ship pulled out at about six o'clock in the evening. We sailed out, of, sailed out of Puget Sound, and we went up and we laid on the uh, life rafts that were up there. It was just beautiful. We thought, oh, this is going to be so pleasurable. Well, it wasn't until then we went into our bunks, and uh, the bunks were uh, four high in that, and the, I was in the, uh, the lowest one down, the lowest set of bunks down. Uh, I think I was in the, in the third one up, and uh, I woke up about three o'clock in the morning. It was no longer pleasurable. I've never seen anything bounce around like that. In the daylight, I got up and went up on deck, and stood on the bow and the bow would go up like this and then crash down and uh, we hit the tail end of a typhoon and that that was coming in off the pacific and uh that that really racked us around for about three days and uh i felt fine until i went to the head uh to relieve myself and everybody there was sick and that's all i needed and uh, I was seasick for about three days on that. I, I didn't, didn't like that too much at all. We, uh, we uh, took the Great Circle route, so we went up toward Alaska and passed uh, Atu and Kiska. And Atu and Kiska were the, were the two, uh, uh, two islands that the Japanese had actually captured uh, during World War II. And they were sh only a short distance off. But that was a, a real worry at that point because... That was pretty close to to Alaska, but we got past there, and the and the travel from there on was uh, was really uh, really great. The seas were great, and uh, we'd get up in the morning uh, just as it started to get light and watch the uh, uh, the uh, so called flying fish that would flutter up and just coast back into the water again. And uh, oh, about three days out of Japan, we ran into a couple of schools of whales, and so there were some really interesting things and then at about uh, I, I think it took us I can't remember what our average speed was I guess around 15 knots I think so it took us about uh, eight days nine days to uh, to get there compared to the time it takes to get to Tokyo now we went into Tokyo Bay and uh, I, I remember going in there how long it took our ship to get in they had the Japanese had underground walls actually put in with chains across some of them, chains with iron that big in them with links of size uh, to hold the uh, any ships or any submarines from coming in there. And, uh, and an invasion in that particular area would have been uh, uh, would, would have been terrible. I mean, it was just just so well guarded, and we had to shoot in each way and have tugboats. Uh, sort of pull us in and then the next thing I know we had I looked over the side and we had all these little kids yelling hey GI cigarette and uh, this is a new world for me seeing something like that I didn't smoke but I then I, I bought some smokes and uh, tossed, the, tossed them over to the kids who wanted them they probably sold them I don't know what they did with them and then we finally landed uh, uh, landed in uh, uh, in the Tokyo area, Tokyo Bay, and we stayed in that area a day or so, and then uh, we were uh, loaded in a truck, uh, six by six, I guess they were called, uh, four-wheel drive trucks with two sets of two sets of driving axles in the back, and uh, I can remember. You think of songs that were around in those days. I remember the driver saying, "Hey, Baba Reba." You probably never heard of that song, but. <laughs> He, he sang that all the way, and they drove us to uh, uh, the village called Kaderia, which was the uh, sort of the west point of training, one point uh, for the Japanese when, when before the war and when the war was going on. And we were stationed in barracks there. And uh, after a few days of training and going through lectures and things and how to handle and don't eat any of the food over here and that sort of thing, uh, uh, we were sent out on regular surveys, so we did we did survey, and the uh, the, the Japanese uh, I can't say do you remember because you aren't old enough, but the, uh, the the Japanese cameras and things like that were noted for being the worst possible things in those days, and and today you know how how good they are, and uh, uh, well I've always I've had Nikon's I think for the last thirty years or so, and they've been great. But the uh, 
and the Japanese surveying was very poorly done. I mean, some places, so if you surveyed along the coast, they would, they would be as much as, uh, as 20, 20 feet off when surveying is a pretty precise type of thing. So they were remapping all of that area uh, that we're in, in in Japan. So the time that I was assigned to Japan, uh, I, I, uh, I spent that time uh, on actual surveys and these are recorded and sent back to Washington for, for the U.S. files and all that, that type of thing. And that was our regular job. And uh, I always wanted to play football, and they had a football team there. So I, I went out for the football team, and uh, I didn't even know that much about football. I played baseball and basketball, but we didn't have a football team in our high school. And all I knew was what I heard on the radio because I didn't have any TV in those days. And... Uh, so the, the football was, uh, was pretty in <coughs> interesting, <coughs> excuse me. So they made me uh, a guard and, a, and the, uh, I think, number three fullback or something like that. I weighed about 190 at that point, and uh, that, that went well pretty, pretty well for a while, but uh, then I received word I was going to be transferred to, uh, uh, to Okinawa. That's when the... I, came up with the eastern tip of Okinawa, and uh, we thought Japan was pretty good duty. It was uh, Yokohama and, uh, and Tokyo were pretty much torn up by, the, by our bombing. I mean, they, the, uh, the castles and the capital and things uh, weren't, but they, they seemed to have avoided those. But they, uh, Yokohama, which is about 20 miles, 12 to 20 miles, I can't remember exactly, from Tokyo, uh, had a lot of wooden buildings, and that was almost uh, all destroyed. But while I was in Okinawa, in Japan, we were, uh, uh, I was near the village of Chafu, and we were doing some, uh, doing a survey there, and the guys that picked us up in the, uh, uh, forgot what the, uh, I guess they're called four by fours. They're, Originally, they were called Jeeps for GP, general purpose, mm -hmm. and uh, but the real Jeep turned out to be the smaller one. And, uh, and some of those Jeeps were made by Mr. Hoshkis, who this library is named after that you're sitting in right now. Oh, really? He produced them, and uh, well, he was a big arms producer in Paris, France, and uh, also produced Jeeps during World War II. But anyway, we were in the 4x4, four four, and then they hit it. A fallen grave marker going through the cemetery, and a jeep tipped over, and it landed on my leg right in the uh, right in the femur, and uh, it, it cracked my femur, but didn't break it. But I was it, it bled through the surface, and uh, that was the end of football, which probably saved me a lot because the next game our team had was with the hundred first Airborne, who was one of the top football teams in the world at that point. I think they were stationed. Yeah. They were stationed in Europe, <laughs> but their football team went all over. So uh, by the time that came about, I'd been notified of my transfer to uh, to Okinawa. And one of the things that happened uh, when we moved out of uh, our place in Kadaria, we went through Tokyo, and we were going to uh, our ship was going to meet us in uh, in Yokohama. And Yokohama had a huge army base. Uh, with tremendous amounts of equipment in there that was really brought over for the invasion of Japan, but then there wasn't any invasion after the uh, nuclear bombs. So uh, I was appointed with my buddy, uh, whose name was O'Donnell, another Irishman, and uh, we were told to, when the first guys came through on the convoy to stop all the traffic, Sounds simple. So we're down there with little flags ready to stop the traffic, except that we got there. There are five roads coming to this one square. And uh, along came the traffic, and uh, along came our, our first lead people, and we stopped it, and our whole company went through. We were the 1541st Engineers, unattached. We're part of the 8th Army, but uh, they could send us any place they wanted for these survey things. And that's, that's why they were, they were sending us in to, uh, to Okinawa. And uh, we were fine until all of our group got through. And then we tried to start the traffic again. Didn't work too well. We had the biggest traffic jam you ever saw. 
right in the middle of the uh, the area between Yokohama and uh, and Tokyo, and finally some Japanese police came along and bailed us out, and they knew how to handle that sort of thing. I mean, they put MP patches on our arms, and we had no training in that type of thing. That wasn't uh, we had to shoot somebody. We were fine. But we had no training of that type. So then uh, uh, we got on a uh, LST landing ship tank, very important in World War and all of the invasions, especially in uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa, but also in uh, in D Day. You've just seen a lot of those on the from the recent D Day photographs and things that they had uh, on June sixth. So um, we got on that and. Uh, the only places to sleep were you either slept in one of the trucks or you rolled out a, a sleeping bag and uh, slept on the floor or on the deck. And uh, these are uh, a, a long vehicle. Mine was number 1010, 1010. They all, they didn't have names. They went by numbers. And they, uh, uh, they um, were flat bottomed. So you had the upper deck, uh, the front opened up when you landed right against the beach and the upper deck dropped down and everything drove out and then the upper deck went back up and the tanks all drove off of the, off of the bottom. So they were a pretty major vehicle and they had LCIs on board, landing craft inventory that took the, uh, took the troops ashore. So we, uh, we got on that. I was very lucky. Three of us found uh, the, the sailors that ran it. Uh, were in the bulkheads where they had very nice rooms between the outer the outer hull and the inner inner wall, and they weren't very very wide rooms, but you had nice comfortable beds in there that uh, cots comfortable in terms of the way we've been living, and uh, that was really great. The uh, three of us stayed in there, and we rode all the way to uh, to Okinawa and that and. Uh, with a flat bottom, if you got in crosswinds or cross currents and that, those things are, are going like this all the time. I think they only drafted about 19 inches or something. Oh, really? So they were, they were pretty, they could run in pretty shallow. And uh, no, I didn't get seasick again. That didn't bother me at all. <laughs> I don't know why. And uh, that was kind of a, you know, that was kind of an interesting trip riding on something like a, 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 an LST, which I'd never been on before. We landed in uh, Buckner Bay in Okinawa, and we were taken to uh, uh, the capital, which was Naha, N-A-H-A, which I believed at the time was named after an ancient ruler or something, but uh, I looked it up last night, and it tells me that it was named for a huge rock that was in the area, and that rock was called Naha, which eventually was limestone, eventually pretty much eroded away because you get acidic rainwater on uh, carbonate rock like that it doesn't last too long but we were we were uh, sent there and we were in Naha for uh, just a few days and uh, then they broke our company up it was an oversized company and it was uh, uh, let's see three platoons all together and we were in platoon number three and they selected our platoon to do the uh, topographic mapping in uh, northern Oka Okinawa. And nor northern Okinawa was off limits. The war wasn't as bad up there, but they never completely got all the Japanese out of there. And so because there were still Japanese soldiers up there, it was off limits. So they, uh, they assigned us when we went to a town called T I A R A Tiara, uh, which was uh, bordered on a little bay uh, just off the East China Sea. And uh, Okinawa, I have a map you can uh, you can take a look at after if you'd like. But uh, Okinawa is about seventy miles long, and it's uh, it's long and thin, and uh, any place from three to seven miles wide, except in one place where it's twenty miles wide because of the big peninsula called Matoba Peninsula that goes out to the west. And uh, off, off of Matoba Peninsula was the island of uh, Aishima, uh, which, which was 
also in the Battle of Okinawa, and uh, it was, uh, uh, that's where Ernie Pyle, I don't know if that name means anything to you, but Ernie Pyle was a very famous war correspondent, and he was killed there by a sniper. And, uh, you know, they also had in the Battle of Okinawa, I'll diverge on that for a moment, uh, in the Battle of Okinawa, uh, General Buckner was the man in uh, charge of it. Whoops. <laughs> General Buckner was the man in charge of it. He was the lieutenant general, and uh, and he was killed in the Battle of Okinawa. And he was one of the one of the uh, one of the generals that actually went with with, with his groups into into actual battle. And uh, he was he was killed when a shell, probably a mortar shell, hit a rock, a coral rock, and just blew the coral all apart. And the coral was what killed him, not the metal from the shell. It was just when you hit it like that, such high speed that it went when it went into his body. So it was finished by another general, I think still well, but I'm not I'm not positive of that. And that was a uh, that was a fierce battle. I think uh, there were close to a hundred thousand uh, uh, Japanese soldiers killed altogether, and some Okinawans that they pressed into service. And uh, I think the United States had twelve thousand five hundred uh, killed. And, but a lot more, uh, a, a lot more casualties than that. And it was a very tough battle because uh, uh, there were a lot of caves in Okinawa, and there were also a big burial tombs that they had built. These burial tombs, and uh, they had uh, caskets inside of those, which were buried inside. And the Japanese were able to get in those and mount guns in those small, small guns and. Uh, and put up a tremendous fight. And uh, if you've ever seen any of the World War II battles of Okinawa, you'll see those are the places where the GIs went in, and the, and the uh, you know, so the Marines went in with flamethrowers. And uh, you'll so, once in a while see a uh, poor guy come out, Japanese coming out uh, on fire, and uh, the flamethrower became a major weapon as a result in that war. So we were stationed in uh, about 45 miles from Naha, which was the capital and being re rebuilt some at that period. And uh, we were outside of this village of Tiara, uh, maybe a couple of miles, right, at, right on the coast. And uh, there was a leper's island just off that, one of the places that they had, they put lepers that, uh, that couldn't be cured. And so that was always a worry that somebody would come on come on shore and you had to be very very careful on that but we started our survey there and we uh, we progressed up through the uh, up through the mountains um, we were on the west coast so most of what my party did was along the uh, along the west coast we had places where the long uh, bays went in and it would be like four or five miles around it and now we've got the T3 theodolite, and we could measure across those things with stadia boards, uh, which we had learned back in back in Fort Belvoir in the engineering. And we and we tied everything into uh, into stars. Uh, we we went out at night and took star shots. And then uh, the nice part was all my ha group had to do was take the star shots, put them at the exact point in the map. We didn't have to do any of the math. That's what the computer guys did, and uh, the computers were human beings and not <laughs> not electric machines like they are today. So that's that's pretty much what we did there. And uh, we had a baseball team, and uh, our survey group uh, had the best record of any survey group on the well of the three platoons on the island, and so. Uh, the guys down in the southern end, uh, was it was much more GI down there, get up for roll call in the morning and things like that. We lived in a, a tent about the size of this room, uh, had six cots in it, and uh, we were there in, well, October to, uh, to March, so uh, it was really uh, getting into the winter season. So it got kind of cool at night sometimes, and we... Uh, Made a stove out of a 50-gallon drum, and had a big, uh, a big water pipe that we found someplace and put in it for a chimney. So uh, we actually had heat in there. Uh, 
uh, we had sho we had showers that uh, we built a shower and you'd uh, pull a handle and you'd fill the whole thing with water up on top and then the water would come down. So the, we had pretty good conditions. We had there there were kitchens there. When we were in the field, we pretty much ate K rations and uh, K rations were uh, pretty much dry dry foods, all canned stuff. And the, the trick was if you, uh, some of that tasted better when it was hot. So about uh, an hour before it was time to eat, you just open the can a little bit and set it on the on the uh, the block, the engine block in the Jeep. And uh, it would be nice and warm by the time high noon came around. So uh, we, we existed pretty well there. Uh, as I say, we, we, we played baseball and I played on the baseball team there. We had some very good baseball players and... I uh, played teams from visiting ships and and things like that that came by, and uh, we got off at uh, we started early in the morning, but we got off about two o'clock in the afternoon for baseball practice, or uh, whether it was just practice or a game, we got off every day for that. We still put a full day in before we started, but we're still we we're still putting in. Uh, more miles in our survey than the two outfits down to the south, so they sent my group down, my group of four, uh, down to show the other guys how to survey, and they knew how to survey as well as we did, but they they didn't work as hard because they got up for a roll call, they went through all that stuff every day, and and uh, some close order drill and all that. We did none of that type of thing up in the northern half. So those are all the good things about the northern half. The uh, the, there were still Japanese soldiers there, and when we get up to the uh, to the higher parts of the island, the the actual peaks weren't that high, but you got to remember you're coming right off of sea level and going almost straight up. So uh, Mount Hado was the highest uh, on the island. That was probably 1,800 feet or so. But when you went up that, that was that was a pretty tough mountain. But we went up to a village called. Uh, uh, Big Tyra. We lived near Little Tyra, and uh, this was in the uh, this was in the mountains. And we got up there, and there were Japanese soldiers there, in uniform with rifles. And uh, I'm the only one armed in our. I had my helmet on, which you see there. And uh, let's see what else did I have? I had the Garand, and I had a uh, uh, Colt automatic 45. And a machete made in Collinsville, Connecticut. Collinsville uh, company made the best machetes in the world. Those, those things are really great, and you need it for it. this. It wasn't true jungle. It was really semi-tropical type of country, but you still got some pretty tough uh, growth down near the surface. And when we got into the into the town. Uh, remember when the guys, when the Japanese soldiers coming over and, li and lifting up my. Uh, uh, machete and just testing it for sharpness and things like that. And there was a uh, there was a guy there who had gone to the University of uh, of uh, in the Philippines. I've forgotten which one it was. Uh, one, one one of the universities in the Philippines spoke fluent English, and so uh, we explained to him what we're doing and that sort of thing. And uh, he was pretty cordial. And we told him that the war was over, and he said he tried to tell these guys, he said, but they wouldn't believe him, that the, the Japanese, that the war was over. So I said, we can take them back, and, uh, you know, that they won't be persecuted, and nothing will happen to them. They'll hold them for a few days and then ship them back to Japan. So we convinced them, four of them decided they'd go back with us, and uh, so we took them in. It's not in my record anywhere. I don't know who got credit for bringing the guys in. But we brought what four guys in, and uh, they uh, were taken down to Naha, and uh, I checked the next time we were down there, and they were all sent back to Japan, and the war is over for about a year, well, a little more than a year at that point. So they were fairly, uh, once convinced, I think, uh, fairly sure nothing much would happen to them. So that, that was most of the rest of my service time was spent in, uh, in Okinawa, and then we heard, we hadn't been there all that long, and then let me, we... Let me ask you real quick, were these four guys, do you think they were, were they hiding out from the war, or do you think they were just soldiers that were posted out there and just never recovered? 
you, you know, or do you, do you have an idea? I, th I think the latter, probably. They were posted out there and just forgotten about. You know, yeah, know. yeah. And, uh, well, there there were some found in the Philippines long after that. Remember, there were some, it was in the news, of, like six years after, yeah. that refused to believe that the war was over. And uh, I would think after they didn't see, see anything flying over bombing them, they'd figure that out after a while. But, uh, and maybe they were, you know, maybe they were uh, safer up there. There wasn't, there wasn't as much battle in the northern half of Okinawa. There was a... Uh, a destroyer that was crippled there, a U.S. destroyer mm -hmm. that was in against the, that got jammed in in one of the typhoons. It was a, there was a typhoon in uh, nineteen forty five, late late forty five, after the fighting had ended and after the war had ended, the officially had ended uh, the shooting part of it anyway, and. Uh, that got jammed into the into the rocks on the shore, and was still there, uh, still there when I left. I'm sure it's gone now. And uh, I looked up Okinawa online yesterday, and uh, I would never recognize anything there. I mean, there's buildings every place, and golf courses, and uh, a little bit different than we, we were there. Also, in the southern half, the fighting was much more much much more serious, and I was down in that area, and there were. Uh, one village of about 60 people, uh, uh, they were told they would be, uh, you know, brutally murdered by uh, the U.S. soldiers. And they uh, they jumped off uh, the southern uh, cliff in Okinawa altogether and committed suicide. So there were a lot of suicides there that because of what they were told by the, by the Japanese uh, army. So... Uh, Truman then issued a uh, issued a statement that uh, all World War II soldiers, which we qualified as, because because we were in, um, if you were in beyond September sixteenth, or before September sixteenth, uh, nineteen forty-five, uh, forty-six, uh, you were you were officially part of World War II, and uh, that all those soldiers be sent home. So we weren't. You know, we weren't over there that long. I was only in as a result a little bit over, well, 14 months or so, so a little bit over a year. And uh, so then we uh, uh, were shipped, uh, we, we went back down to uh, the Buckner Bay area. And, uh, oh, I should say that, well, that we also uh, used the, the LCI from our, from our uh, LST. And we would go to some of the islands and survey those. And uh, I mean, some of these islands were extremely small. If they showed up, if they showed during uh, low tide, they, you counted them. And of course, they needed to know where they were. And that's that's where we found that a lot of the things that the Japanese maps had were twenty feet off. Which, if you're traveling with a ship or something, can be a can be a major factor. And uh, so we did. We did survey. Uh, went around in the LCIs and surveyed some of those islands. I even named one Kirby K I R B Y. You could name the island, but uh, they, and then of course that was all sent to Washington. And some guy in Washington then uh, erases Kirby and puts his own name down. I'm sure it never went anyplace. But several of us, if if uh, if your name wasn't more than six or seven letters or something, you could put your own name on it. I doubt if any of ours ever made it to, uh, you know, you got some guy sitting behind the desk and uh, I'm sure his name is on there. I can't remember exactly where it was anyway. So uh, then then we were sent home on the Sedalia Victory, which was uh, another ship. This time I was in the uh, in the bow and the bow, the bow deck ran all the way down to the bottom as well. And uh, uh, I think that I think the decks, the uh, Bunks in there were, they were four high. I had the top one, I remember. You had to climb all the way up in that. And uh, that took us, uh, we were on that ship for 17 days altogether. Uh, we were told we were going to stop in Hawaii, which we thought was great, uh, being able to stop in Hawaii, and because uh, they were supposed to pick something up there because it was a transport. And these these are all merchant marine ships, the Victory ships. They didn't 
they weren't Navy ships. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the big ones like the general ships were Navy and Army ships that carried, as I said before, 5,000 people. So the, uh, the Army, uh, the, our stop in Hawaii got canceled while we're, before we got to Hawaii, so we went on by there. And we pulled into, uh, 14 days later, we put in, pulled into uh, Golden Gate and went under the Golden Gate Bridge, which is it's pretty spectacular after you've been, I know nobody was shooting at us, but uh, you, you wonder sometimes if you're going to make it back from a place like that, too. And uh, that was a very welcome sight, and we landed, uh, went into the bay, and they stopped us out by Alcatraz, and told us that uh, it was Washington's birthday weekend, and so the docks were closed for three days. So you guys got to sit out here for three days. <laughs> so we sat there. Guys are saying, I think I could swim that far. I said, hey, you got this far. Don't, don't push it. And uh, so they, uh, they, they sat there for, uh, we sat there for three days. And uh, then we went down to uh, the Oakland Army base, which is still there. And that was a huge base, and uh, we we docked there, and uh, were unloaded, and de-shipped, I guess it was, and uh, went into uh, uh, the holding base that they had there. And uh, it, it was the bit the biggest building I ever saw, I think, in my life, and, and just bunks. That's all that was there. And you went someplace else for a chow, and then we uh, got a pass to go to. Uh, to uh, San Francisco, so we went into San Francisco and uh, we went to a, a nightclub. This was in the, in the afternoon; it was two o'clock. And we went to a nightclub, and uh, nobody will ever believe this, but I ordered a bottle of milk. I hadn't had any milk since they left home, and I never drank anything and I, alcoholic in the, in the Pacific, and uh, or I didn't at that time anyway, and. Uh, this girl came in and she said, do you guys, oh, she welcomed us and everything, and she said, uh, uh, do you guys mind if I practice? She said, I'm singing tonight, and no, we can go right ahead, and bother us any. And uh, when we left, she came over again and introduced herself, and uh, her name was Peggy Lee, who became quite quite a singer in her career, and uh, died just a few, it wasn't too long ago, I don't think, several years, but... Uh, she was around for quite a while, so we met Peggy Lee, Peggy Lee, which is probably one of the high points of my career, I guess, in the Army. We also, I forgot one in the, uh, I won't go back too far, but in Mount Hado, uh, which was the highest uh, point, and this had nothing to do with our service record, it had to do with competition among GIs, and uh, I had my own Jeep in, in Okinawa, and it was great. I could go any place I wanted, and... Uh, and uh, it, it, nights when I was sergeant of the guard, you could drive all over northern o Okinawa and uh, just checking to make sure that nothing was out of order. And uh, we got to Mount Hado, and I bet a guy I could drive up it in a Jeep. And uh, there was a, you couldn't go right to the peak, but you could get up almost to the peak of, of Mount Hado. And so I drove up it in a Jeep, and I made it. And uh, so the next day, my buddy and the other group drove up it in the Jeep. So that kind of competition really bothered me. So the next day, I backed up all the way and made it. <laughs> and he couldn't do that. So <laughs> the one the one thing I met left in, in Okinawa. But uh, coming back was quite an experience uh, from, uh, 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 from Oakland. Uh, there was a blizzard in the, uh, in the Rockies, so we couldn't take the... Uh, Central Pacific Union Pacific, the old Transcontinental Road. We couldn't take that back across, so uh, we had it. This time we had a troop train, and it had Pullman cars, and re regular the the bunk Pullman cars that you see they pull down in the old days. And these are probably World War One age, but they were in nice condition and uh, and and quite comfortable. And we got and they put us in those. And we went down to uh, Los Angeles. I was in the top bunk, so I, there's no window up there. I had to hang down and look out upside down to see. I saw Los Angeles as we went through it. 
and then we went to Yuma, Arizona, and then, uh, uh, let's see, Tucson, and we got to, we got to Tucson, Arizona, and just how much, I don't know if you've been in that area, but I've been out there recently, it's, I mean, it's growing up the mountains by the day almost, but Tucson, the train went right down the main street, and they parked on the main street, and the, the, uh, Sergeant on our car said, you've got 30 minutes. We blow the whistle in 25. The train leaves in 30. If you're not on it, you figure out how to get to the East Coast yourself. Nobody's going to miss, believe me, after that. So uh, we got off and then, you know, went around town, grabbed something to eat, and then got back on the train. And the train went right back out of the the uh, uh, main street again. And uh, in those days, the railroad was the, was the center of activity. And and very important. They still are out there much more than they are certainly in the east. So then we went down to uh, 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 s southwestern Texas and we were in, I knew Texas was big, I didn't know it was that big, and uh, we are in Texas for three days working our way across it up to the corner of Arkansas. But the uh, part of the reason that it took us so long to get across the country was that uh, the Army owned the on those trains in those days, but they didn't own the railroad. And uh, just as it is now, in some cases out there, Conrail owns the tracks, and your passenger trains sometimes have to pull off and wait for the freight trains to go by. And we had to do that all across Texas. And then we uh, got up to St. Louis, and we went there from Fort Dix. And Fort Dix, I, uh, I was uh, discharged in Fort Dix. I was offered the opportunity to re-enlist and uh, turned it down, and by that time I wanted to go to college, so uh, I, uh, I headed back home from, uh, from Fort Dix and then uh, started college that fall. And I went to what's CCSU now, right? You're stationed there, or you're... I'm a student there. You're a student there. Oh, okay. I was in the class. I started in the fall of 47, and I was in the class of 51. And uh, I uh, I went there because they had a great basketball team. They were a real powerhouse in those days, and uh, I thought that would be great for me. I didn't make the team, but I became part of the basketball organization there, and uh, I really got a very good education out of that on the GI Bill because of the fact that I was in until in before September sixteenth, nineteen forty six. I qualified for uh, for just over three years, so I didn't have it full in my senior year. But by that time, most of the, most of my things had been completed anyway. And uh, the the uh, the size of uh, Teachers College of Connecticut when I got out of the service, that was just before the war, was a little over three hundred. Uh, the class of uh, that went in in forty six was uh, seven hundred fifty. And I went in 47 with 750. So we lived downtown in Quonset huts and things like that. And uh, so, uh, you know, the Dietrich G uh, Gymnasium at, uh, at Central? Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Dietrich and I were in college together. And uh, he was a good friend of mine, still is. He was a great coach. And uh, uh, I, I haven't seen him this year, but... I not only saw him, I interviewed his his daughter later on for a teaching job at one point. So there were a lot of good connections. I was very fortunate in that way. So you went on to be a teacher then? I went on, uh, I majored in education. Uh, the only, one thing that happened was that my major got changed because the, they desperately needed elementary teachers because the war babies hadn't got to the high school level yet. And so I, they, they, uh, I was a biology major, and then my junior year they told me, uh, secondary biology majors, uh, there were 28 in our class, and we're taking the top four. And uh, maybe they should have taken the bottom four, I might have made it, but they, so I didn't get it, but I, 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 had, I graduated with concentrations in, uh, in biology and uh, uh, other sciences and history, and uh, it really did me a lot of good, as it turned out, because I got certified for just about anything that came along. And then, I, then I went on from there to be uh, 
uh, uh, I taught at the high school level and I coached basketball, baseball, and football. And then I was athletic director and uh, I was principal and then I became assistant superintendent of schools. And four times I was the interim superintendent, but I really didn't want that job. I, I didn't want to work with boards. I wanted to work more with uh, with teachers and students, which you had a lot more opportunity there. So that's uh, some of my story. Well, um, did you maintain any close relationships with any of your, your people you were in the service with? There were uh, there were some that I did for a while, and uh, uh, one a fellow by the name of uh, Hollis. Uh, every Every 10 years at that point, each town has to undergo a reevaluation for tax purposes. And, uh, and Hollis was, uh, he, he was the one, he worked for the outfit. A lot of our surveyors got jobs with people like that because they, having topographic survey backgrounds, uh, they were pretty well suited for it. And uh, so he, I think this was probably about five years after after the service time, he spent quite a bit of time in Sharon working on that, going around all the houses, and he went to the place that I worked, and uh, so I saw quite a bit of him there. I corresponded with some uh, fellow by the name of Dan Fr Francis, who was uh, uh, he was a football player and an excellent physicist, really smart. He was from Pittsburgh, and uh, I don't know if I ever saw him again, but we would call back and forth every once in a while. I had two good buddies from the New York area, a fellow by the name of Ernie Lane and another one, uh, uh, Jimmy Lynch. And uh, about five years ago, Ernie Lane, so five years ago, he would have been 83, I guess. I was two years younger, I was 81. Uh, came to the Sharon Playhouse, which is right down the line here, and I live just up the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he came up on a bus, senior, one of those senior tours or something like that. So he, he came out during the intermission and asked this guy, he said, do you know a guy by the name of Ed Kirby? And the, and the guy says, yeah, I know Ed. He's spoken at my school, and uh, this was a guy from the Hoshi School. And uh, so he called me up, and I came down, but they were all back in the play. And I never did, I missed him. You know, he was six foot two, good looking and brown haired when I knew him. And I, I see these guys come out and everybody was 80 and or 85. And I had no idea. We never did make contact again. And I made contact through, through friends of his and friends of mine that would give word back and forth, but we never really got together. So it was, uh, my best buddy was a fellow from, uh, from Georgia, and I made attempts to contact him, but I never was uh, never was able to. We, uh, one guy uh, that that was in the same tent as me in Okinawa was also uh, also I had contact with uh, through the mail a couple of times, but I was kind of isolated from most of the people that I was in the service with, and. Uh, and just never really, you know, we had, we had talked about in five years we're going to get together, you know, the usual thing when you're when you're getting out of the service, but that that really never happened. Well, did did you join any uh, veterans organization? Or I was I was in the uh, uh, the, the uh, local uh, American Legion, and uh, when I first started teaching, when I became assistant superintendent of schools. Uh, I had board meetings almost every night, and one board meeting in one of the towns was the same night as the one down here. And I just went on as a uh, auxiliary member or something for a while, and it kind of dropped off. And I was sort of sorry, but uh, you know, it just in the, in the, I still have I still am in nine organizations that have meetings, and it, I don't need any more. But that, it's, it's a good group down there, and I know the guys and everything, but I haven't been active in that in, in years. Um, uh, how do you think your, your service experience has affected or impacted your life since you got out? Do you think it's had much impact? Or you... I, 
I think it's had a lot of impact. I think the, uh, you know, I got to know people in, uh, not much in Japan. Japan was, was a little tougher. Uh, not that we had disagreements with people, but you didn't fraternize much with, with the people there at that, at that time. Not like now. Uh, but in Okinawa, uh, some of the villagers that lived right around us, we got to know quite well. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, Tea House of the August Moon, you ever hear of that? That was a play that came out. And uh, it takes place in Okinawa. And uh, Sakini, the native boy in that, says something, Okinawans, very lucky. Uh, not have to govern, governed by Japanese, governed by Chinese, governed by United States, <laughs> never have to govern. And uh, the, the line was something like that. But um, I, I think I got an appreciation for, you know, I was always interested in other countries, but I got an appreciation for Okinawa. Okinawa was very important to me. And uh, being a country kid, I think was much better for me to be in Okinawa than the guys that were city guys. They would have been better off in Europe or better off staying in Japan. But it, it was, I mean, here we are in the northern half of Okinawa, and uh, we had maybe 40 people in that, in that platoon, counting our, our truck drivers and cooks and things like that. And there were five people that were in observation post uh, on the northern tip of Okinawa, and there's nobody else around that's... Uh, that's Caucasian. I mean, everybody else are, are native people. And uh, so you learn to deal with the with the people well. And uh, the Okinawans are very friendly. I mean, they that just, uh, and what they've been through and everything else, uh, that had to be tough in some cases. But, and they were told, I told you how many, that so many of them committed suicide. And uh, because they were told that that would be you know, really abused, and uh, when they found out they weren't, I think they that opened the world for them a little bit too. And uh, being in different places and seeing the country, and uh, I, I vowed that my kids would never cross the United States by plane until they went by land. And so when when we had uh, the oldest was sixteen and the youngest was four. We took our first of uh, five trips across the United States, and uh, that made a tremendous difference in their lives. And uh, I've got one of them now that flies to, well, he's been to something like 37 countries or something on his job. He's all over, all over the place. But he crossed when he was four years old, and he knows this country like the back of his hand. I mean, it just, I think it's so important to, uh, to see what we really have here. And, uh, uh, you know, I felt so strongly about the United States, especially during the time of World War II when I was growing up and putting up a lot of that stuff and watching for airplanes at two o'clock in the morning at, up on top of uh, Sharon Mountain. Dr. Tesoro, who was in here before that was getting interviewed, uh, uh, he lives right on top of uh, the E Street section of Sharon where we had a uh, 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 observation post during World War II, and we used to pull, there were different ones, and, and my dad and I used to pull, the, usually we got the either 12 to 2 or 2 to 4, because we had to start work at 5, and we usually didn't finish up too early at night, so that was the best one for us. So, uh, yeah, I think it changed my life, and, and uh, it's something I've never forgotten, and uh, I was very fortunate. I didn't have to go through being shot at, and as as many of my friends were. And some of my buddies are uh, were in the actual invasion of Okinawa. Well, listen. I want to I want to thank you for for letting me sit here and talk with you, and for letting us interview you. And thank you for your service. You're quite welcome. <laughs>